morning and thank you so much for joining us here on the Morning Medical Update. I'm Jessica Lovell. It's winter and just like many of you, we are working hard to bring you some fun and exciting programs in the coming weeks and months. This morning we are bringing you a rebroadcast of one of our favorite shows. If you have any questions, please leave them below and we will answer them during our live broadcasts on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays in January. We'll resume our Monday through Friday live schedule in February. So sit back and enjoy this best of morning medical update. Good morning. It is Thursday, September 15th. I'm Jessica Lovell, curing prostate cancer with a single beam of light. Uh, whenever any patient hears the word cancer, they have all kinds of crazy thoughts that go through their mind. They sure do. And this morning, you're going to hear the personal stories of how proton therapy is changing lives and now closer to home. And helping those who can't afford medical care, the event benefiting Vibrant Health in Wyandotte County. Treatment for prostate cancer and how it may affect the heart. Our experts weigh in at 10 o'clock this morning. We'll have a preview of today's All Things Heart. Good morning and thanks for joining us on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. It's a tissue sparing radiation treatment for specific types and locations of cancer, including prostate cancer. Joining us in studio soon to be will be Chief Medical Officer Dr. Steve Stites, who is a cancer survivor himself, but also Shin Ling Shin. Dr. Shin Ling Shin is joining us today um, and some of his patients. Doctor, how are you? Wonderful. Good morning. Oh, good to see you. Um, so we're just going to hang tight, wait for Dr. Dr. Stites to get here. He's he's going to be coming in here quick, so we'll hold the spot for him. We've also um, are going to be joined by Ross Wilkinson, a patient who has undergone proton therapy for prostate cancer uh, farther away, and patient Warren Haynes, who is currently undergoing proton therapy treatment for prostate cancer right now. I think he actually just finished up um, this week, I'm, I'm hoping. So we're gonna catch up with him here in just a moment. So a big welcome to all of our guests today. As always, you have great questions, so please get them sent in to us and um, we will get those answered. You have links to those right there on your screen. In headlines this morning, cancer in people under 50 is rising worldwide. A review in the Nature Reviews Clinical Oncology says since the 1990s, rates of 14 cancers have been inching up annually among younger adults. It includes everything from breast cancer, colon, liver, and pancreatic cancer. While the reasons are not fully clear, it is likely changes in lifestyle and environment, processed foods, you name it, those types of things uh, certainly have taken their toll. However, the future for patients with prostate cancer has improved in recent years through advancements in technology, imaging, and the way treatment is delivered. Research has found ways to better identify tumors and tailor the treatments to each patient. That includes proton therapy, a highly targeted treatment that destroys cancer cells in the prostate while reducing the radiation exposure to the bladder and other surrounding organs. We recently, as you know, opened our proton therapy center here at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. But 10 years ago, John Minor traveled nearly 400 miles to Oklahoma City to receive proton therapy for his prostate cancer. This morning, he shares his story. Perfect timing, we have a two minute package. I could tell when the physician came into the room and I could tell by his body language that I was going to be positive for cancer. The diagnosis, whenever any patient hears the word cancer, they have all kinds of crazy thoughts that go through their mind. How long have I got to live? When will I die? Where is the cancer? What's going on? Well, at that time I was farming and you know fall is harvest time. So I did my treatments during the week and came home on the weekend. This is my favorite hobby now, retirement. Well, you enjoy it because when you buy a farm, you buy it with the intention of making it better. I had 44 treatments, and my treatments essentially ran five days a week, every day at the same time. Here's one of my heirlooms. That's a 1963 Ford. I'm the second owner. I bought it from the man who bought it brand new in 1963. I felt nothing in terms of being ill 
or sick to my stomach or anything like that. No adverse reactions at all. So I continued life as it was, feeling like it had been taken care of. I still mow hay and, and I have a neighbor that does custom baling for me. I did seek out KU for second opinion, find out what they thought was going on. And I kept asking them, you know, why don't you have a proton clinic here? And the interesting thing that I got from the medical community in general, this is experimental proton. It's not approved by the AMA. And I said, well, look at me. I'm walking proof. Corn to the right, soybeans right here in front of us. Here's the okra. Love those tomatoes. Here's my pear tree. This is old fashioned pear. The other thing I would say to men, if you are not getting checked from age 40 on, my GP physician, he had established a baseline for me. Started when I turned 40 and he knew immediately when my PSA levels began to increase. I'm doing very well. I'm active, retiring from farming, but I still do things around the farm here. I told you he'd be here. Where have you been? Working out? Yeah, Important that's meeting? What, I was what do you got? Yeah, it was a meeting. It was a, <laughs> some unimportant thing about the what future of healthcare. What are you, the chief know. medical officer and have busy things going on? Nothing to Nothing do. Nothing to do. Nothing well, to do. I'm kind of putting you in a different position today. I, we always get your oh, expertise. Yeah. Dr. Shen's going to share his expertise, but I, I really want to talk about um, your bout with prostate cancer. So um, you've always been open about sharing that. So we're going to yes. ask you some questions I'm and happy things to like talk that. About so, that. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, let's welcome everyone else. We want to welcome our other guest today, Ross Wilkinson, as we have mentioned, who also had proton therapy for his prostate cancer, and Warren Haynes, a current proton patient here at the health system. He's one of Dr. Shen's patients. I'm so glad to have all of our folks with us today. Ross, like John, you also had to travel to Oklahoma City to receive your treatment. Tell us what it's like to add travel being away from family, friends, or support group um, during a cancer diagnosis. What was that like for you? Well, let me correct first. I, I had my uh, uh, therapy at uh, Loma Linda, oh. uh, California, who invented this proton. So, so, yeah, in, in 03. And uh, correct, to go along with John right off the bat, he was correct. He, the urologist tried to tell me it was experimental. Like I say, this was 03 when I went out there. And I, when I got out there, I found out they'd been doing it since 1991. I don't consider that experimental at all. But along with John, yes, I, there, were no, there were no symptoms outside the fact that the PSA was going up. And uh, in fact, they even did another test because I really didn't want to go through that exam again. And they said, well, you've got a good 50% chance. So that's when I got the... Uh, set up and went out to Loma Linda. But wow. yeah, there, uh, no, no side specs. In fact, would uh, the guys go out and play golf or uh, they actually had a big uh, exercise area there that uh, you'd get your treatment, go over and, and work out. Yeah, it's, it's just, you never knew you were being treated for anything. Fantastic. And wow, you, you traveled quite a ways to get your, your, your proton therapy. Uh, thank yeah. you for sharing that. Certainly not experimental, Dr. Shen. No, no. This is like, like you said, it's been around for a very long time. Um, the technology for it is very well established and it keeps evolving too. You know, um, the technology we used um, from 10 years ago is actually not the same at all as what we use right now. Um, so, but, but certainly not experimental. Um, and it's actually, you know, um, it's, uh, to be honest, very well established compared to a lot of other things we do. So. It feels new sometimes. I mean, it, when we talk about technology, yeah. it always feels like, you know, fresh out of the, you know, well, <laughs> fresh just, off the presses, if, if and I it's not. Take my yeah. patient hat off from yeah. it, put my yeah. administrative hat back yeah. on. What I'd say is that it feels new because it's brand new to our area yeah. because we just have the Proton yeah. Center now. And also yeah. because, to be very honest, Proton Center, they're expensive to put in, yeah, like yeah. really expensive. And so that's why you don't see a lot of them in the United States or anywhere in the world. Yeah. But the, the fact is that they are clearly not new. Insurance does pay for it. We do get it approved mm -hmm. through an insurance company because it's established therapy. Yeah. And, and, and Dr. Shen, there are clearly diagnoses for which it is established now yeah. as a preferred mode of therapy. Right. No, that, that's absolutely true. Um, so I, you know, I, I want to say we obviously treat um, prostate cancer patients uh, with proton therapy, but 
our proton facility is not only for prostate cancer patients, right? I mean, we have a lot of um, uh, pediatric patients, other patients where protons is clearly, clearly head and shoulders above what else we can do. Now, for prostate cancer patients too, though, it is um, likely a significant benefit over um, some of um, uh, the, some of the other treatment options that we have, radiation options that we have, because of the way the protons work. So, Dr. Seitz, how long ago were you diagnosed with prostate cancer? I think it's been three or four years. You know, I was in an active surveillance program uh -huh. because my brother had prostate cancer, my dad, my, my, my granddad, and so there's a strong family history. Mm -hmm. And so um, my, my, my uh, PSA had gone up and I had annual exams mm -hmm. and sometimes semi-annual exams and then it was positive one time. Mm -hmm. For I'm very fortunate. Um, unlike the patients you're hearing from today, mm -hmm. I fell into this lower risk category mm -hmm. of active surveillance. So mm -hmm. um, the, uh, my fellow prostate cancer patients out here will all know what, remember what it's like to get prostate biopsies a lot. And so I get to do that frequently. Right. Uh, I follow with a great doc here at KU, um, Will Parker, who does a mm -hmm. great job. He's been on this program before with prostate cancer patients and is one of our great urologists. But, you know, you, you get these biopsies a lot, and the, the good news is so far those biopsies are staying in, in, in a good position so I don't have to do the surgical yeah. care or radiation therapy. But, you know, if I do, I'll be seeing this gentleman here to my right. <laughs> right. And I'll want to think about doing it like that. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's an important thing. There are so many choices now, but prostate cancer, there are those, I'm in an active surveillance, and sometimes you never have to have anything mm -hmm. done. Sometimes it can escalate and you have to move to therapy, but the key is to be actively surveyed. And uh, for the other folks on this call, obviously that didn't work as well. So, so, but, so did I hear you say that in, in some ways having that family history puts you in a place where you were constantly getting checked, where if yeah. somebody didn't have that family history, they would have no reason to be screened? Is that, yeah. is what, is that know, what I understand? I'm, I'm, my wife would say maybe I'm a hypochondriac. Yeah. Well, you know, I, she would tell, tell you that I get the man flu now and then, <laughs> and I would dispute that. But, but um, I think that you know, when you know what the, the odds are around you because you have this very active history, yeah. then you have to be more careful with your surveillance. Warren? Good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, you're, cur you're currently undergoing treatment here at our Proton Therapy Center, nice, close to home as it, as it should be. Tell us about your experience. Uh, my experience right now has been uh, pretty good. So I'm in uh, treatment number 23 today out of 25. So Monday will be my last uh, day with the uh, Proton <laughs> Therapy. And then we're going to the uh, next uh, phase, which I think is the brachy therapy. Um, so right now, uh, everything is going uh, pretty good. Um, want to thank uh, Dr. Shen for being a uh, advocate and, and working with me uh, through this process and this decision making, but everything's going pretty good right now. What signs did you have, if any? So about two years ago, uh, you know, I go for my annual uh, physicals and routine checkups and my prostate uh, PSA levels were uh, elevating. Uh, the doctor told me and I uh, asked, well, should I go to urologist? And it was like, no, we can, let's wait, let's kind of observe it. So when I went back again, it was even higher. Uh, then, you know, I was sent to the uh, urologist and it kind of makes me think about health equity and some of the uh, studies that I kind of look at um, in terms of, uh, and I'll use this example, for example, a woman of color with maternal uh, care uh, during the birthing process, uh, they have a higher percentage of uh, death for uh, various reasons. And also with um, individuals, uh, men of color and other uh, minoritized communities, uh, sometimes we're not taken as uh, seriously, some might say, or we're uh, kind of, uh, thought of as being immune to certain pain and things of that nature. So I think it boils down to uh, culturally competent care and how we uh, look at patients based on, uh, you know, a number of factors. When we look at COVID and the uh, comorbidity and uh, a lot of the deaths that happen in community of color, so I think as uh, physicians and as uh, practitioners, we kind of need to be aware of that. And as uh, patients and clients, we need to uh, really uh, think about self-advocacy in a different way. Oh, wow, really I was going to say, there's that nothing else true. we could say. You've just yeah. now turned into one of our experts. And <laughs> yeah. I, Dr. Shin, I can't help and yeah. you know think, but he, he's, he's like right. the perfect patient yeah. who's yeah. getting checked. He knows his yeah. stuff. Um, but I do want to elaborate on what Warren said about, and Dr. Seitz, you're big on yeah. trying to close the gap when it comes to any of these disparities mm -hmm. or people having access in different communities. So Dr. Shin, I'll let you get us started. Dr. Seitz, weigh in. But just yeah. how are we working to make sure that everyone, people yeah. of color, everyone has access to these no. these 
treatments. And I, I think I would echo everybody's thoughts, you know, Warren and Jessica. I mean, you know, we, we know that there is an access problem um, in, in America. Um, you know, uh, we know that um, uh, people of color, black people, um, you know, um, and some other, you know, disparities like geographic disparities, like rural patients, are diagnosed um, later on in the disease course. Um, and maybe they're not always offered all the treatments uh, on a national level, you know, if you kind of look at the numbers. Um, that is something we need to work on, we are working on. Um, I know there's a lot of um, great investigators, even here at, here at KU, who are working on this disparities problem. Um, and, um, you know, we just uh, need to do more and try to find ways to improve access to everybody. Um, in terms of, like, um, uh, treatments, we, we also know that for, um, for black patients, there is something biologic that stage for stage, black patients do a little bit worse. Mm -hmm. um, and they, actually, for, in terms of screening guidelines, black patients should be screened, uh, or black uh, people should be screened a little bit earlier than the average screening recommendation um, because they do get um, uh, ca prostate cancer a little bit earlier and a little bit more aggressive. Um, yeah. Dr. Uh, Sykes, what can you add? Yeah, you know, here's what I would say. First of all, our guest is dead on right. Thank yeah. you for saying that. It's yeah. something we've said in this forum before, yeah. so I appreciate your voice and hearing that voice. Um, I think what we've struggled with is medical knowledge is way up here, yeah. right? And prostate cancer has come so far, yeah. you know, and I think, you know, this is mm -hmm. a man, this is breast cancer in men, and so to speak, in that um, it, it is yeah. the, one of the leading causes of death in men from cancer. And the problem is that if the knowledge is here, in different communities, how much that knowledge has gotten into the community is very different. Mm -hmm. So for some, you know, in general, in white, middle, upper class communities, the what knowledge level and the reaction to that knowledge and how you interface with it is just at a higher, is a different level. And what we find is in underserved uh, communities, and especially in people of color, that level has not gotten to the healthcare that needs to be delivered. For a lot of, I think, institutionalized racism and other issues that have created disparities in healthcare in this country for our you know, a, a very, very long time. And so I appreciate what our guest is saying. I, and I'm, I'm fortunate, I think, I'm, I'm glad that you recognized it and also that you were able to get into getting uh, proton therapy cancer because that's absolutely the right thing to do. And so I hope that the delay you had in that first elevated PSA to the second PSA was truly watchful waiting and not because of a disparity or a differentiating yeah. in care. I heard you say that, and I wondered if you felt like that, if you felt like when you first had it, people didn't take you seriously enough. Yeah, I thought that uh, I should have really been sent to the urologist when I first asked. Yeah. So I was kind of diagnosed with uh, stage one intermediate. I wonder if I'd have got sent early, would it have just been yeah. stage one? So uh, I, I heard I, that in your voice, and I yeah. wondered if maybe that yeah. because that's because yeah, because yeah, you know, I, as a healthcare provider, my PSA went up, and I knew the family history. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go see this guy. I know I know who to go see, and I did. And, yeah. and uh, but people in the people in public don't know that they don't yeah. have that inside game knowledge, and and. Um, and so I think it's, you know, you, you've got, people have to take it seriously, right? They have to take every patient seriously and with the same degree of intent and, and, and uh, commitment. So. All right. All of our guests, table your thoughts for one moment. We're going to check in with Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control. He's got our COVID count this morning. Good morning. How are you, both of you? I'm good, yeah. <laughs> Doing well. Good. You know, very intense subject for sure. Uh, right now in the health system, we have 24 active infections, six in the ICU, three on the ventilators, 25 in that recovery period. Has gone down a little bit. Um, again, I think all we can, we can hope for is continue to see decrease uh, in the amount of active cases here. Uh, but overall, again, still nationally, cases and hospitalizations are continuing to fall. There doesn't seem to be any new variant of concern on the horizon, so that's good. And of course, uh, you know, we have gotten uh, the new updated, that bivalent booster. We got that in to the health system uh, yesterday. So we are giving those updated boosters for people that, that meet that criteria, which is really a lot of different, it's a, it's a broad, broad, broad range for sure. Yeah. Really anybody five years and older. Right? Yeah, I mean, 12, 12 years 12. and older. Yep. I mean. well, Absolutely. That leads me to a question because there are a couple of COVID questions mm -hmm. we didn't get to yesterday. And Jacqueline wants to know when will those five, and younger 
or older, mm -hmm. between that 12 or actually 12 and younger, then be eligible for that bivalent bo booster. Yeah, I think we are expecting within the next couple months, we know in those FDA regu uh, recommendations, uh, I think Dr. Walensky has even said that uh, in the next few weeks to a couple months, there will be recommendations for those younger age groups. And another question is from Michael, just speaking to the safety of the bivalent mm -hmm. vaccine, just yeah. what, what should we know? Yeah, I mean, there's no plausible reason why the mechanism would be different. Um, so far in the early uh, stages of testing, uh, we know that the safety profile continues to be good. We have, you know, what is it, 600 million doses or so given total of the vaccine overall. Very excellent safety profile. There's no reason to understand or believe that there would be a different safety profile with this. And so far, um, even in those you know early animal models or early animal studies, again, even with the original Omicron variant bivalent vaccine, uh, there doesn't appear to be any cell, uh, signals of any problem. So it continues to be safe. Yeah. And just to say, Walgreens and CVS got the vaccine last week, and there mm -hmm. are no signals in that population. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People who have been vaccinated with bivalent already, there's not been any early early problem, and there's not going to be. This is safe yeah. technology. We've been using it for over almost 20 years now, mm -hmm. and I think this idea that the, the COVID vaccine is somehow evil, just it just needs to it just needs to kind of go away. We're past that. Yeah, it's all over. It's okay. yesterday. Gene has a question. And I know you'll want to jump in on this too, Dr. Stites, but if the CDC community transmission map uh -huh. shows that Johnson County is red and the national map is also red, so why aren't more precautions uh, being taken? Dr. Dr. Uh, Hawkinson, I'll let you start. Yeah, so we know that there is um, community levels, but then there's also this transmission, which are different levels. It's hard to describe and, and discern those. Um, for the community, they're really looking at cases and the cases per, uh, per 100,000, um, but for transmission, it's, it is just a little bit different. We tend to use that more for healthcare settings rather than general community transmission maps, which we all see. Um, and again, I think there's a variety of reasons why more precautions aren't being taken. Are they uh, necessarily public health reasons? No, we, we've kind of discussed that before. Uh, but there are other reasons, you know, certainly it is economic reasons, keeping businesses open. And I don't know, understand what exactly you mean by more precautions. Are we talking about limit gatherings, limit sizes of, of groups in certain places like bars and restaurants, masking? Those are all things that we're taking into account. But there are many reasons other than uh, public and individual health that those precautions aren't being taken. Yeah, I think I think there's the plus. I think what I would add to that is that what Remember that the new guy, the things where the CDC changes and recommends different levels of masking, which is the next real step, right? Let's be honest, this masking and decreasing indoor gatherings. Um, that's based upon hospital capacity. Mm -hmm. as much it's one of the most important features now and and the truth is that hospitals are full but they're not just full of COVID patients they're full of a lot of th things but we're not wrestling with capacity like we did last December and January when things were at a crisis point and so I think if we, that changes when we'll, we'll have a different conversation but right now what we're seeing is this is not as bad of a time and I think that's because a a lot of people have had COVID so they've already got some immunity built up and vaccination is extraordinarily successful and drugs like Paxlovid have changed the yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a safer time. It doesn't mean that you're completely safe from the pandemic. That's not a true statement. But it's really endemic. This is where we're going to be for a while. And then it becomes a public value judgment. And healthcare mandates like masking are political decisions. Mm -hmm. They're not only health decisions. And I think there's clearly not a political drive to go back to masking. And I don't know that we need to go back to masking. I think it's back to individual choices, mm -hmm. individual decisions. And I think, Hawk, I think we're at a different point in the pandemic than we yeah. were before. Because our tools are so much better uh -huh. than they were before. Oh, I think absolutely. Just all you said, you know, getting vaccinated, getting that immunity, previous infection, but also getting tested early, getting on Paxlovid if you fall into that higher risk uh, of patients as well. And just to be clear, um, while things are different in the community, still in the health system and in healthcare facilities, we are still using a universal masking though. All right, let's get to some reporter questions today. Any on the line? Well, then we're going straight to the community. Uh, Ross, I want to bring you back in the conversation. And um, Angie sure. was asking, uh, had you ever heard of proton therapy before? Did your doctor bring it up to you or did you bring it up to them? How was that conversation? Oh. Yeah, no, actually, the, like I said, the, the doctor, when I questioned him about it, 
he, of course, like I said, he said it was experimental, which was proven wrong. But you no, know, I had been to a couple of uh, seminars. At uh, one gentleman actually had been through it and uh, put on a seminar talking about it, the uh, proton. And uh, that's when I kind of remembered that after I was diagnosed. And uh, so I started investigating uh, it out and it just, it, it sounded like the safest and easiest way to go. Yeah. Wow, I, I just can't help but think these are like just two really smart, yeah. insightful smart uh, uh, patients that, you yeah. know, listened and asked questions, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's most important, right, Dr. Chen? Absolutely. You know, um, I, I think like uh, getting a second opinion is actually really important. Um, you know, you're making a decision that's going to affect your health for the rest of your life. And I think a lot of times, you know, you don't necessarily want to jump into the first treatment. I, I think one of the, the, the way we practice here at KU, I, I really appreciate is um, many, almost many of the patients have access you know, to uh, multidisciplinary care. So, right, so you get opinion from radiation oncologists, you get opinion from urologist, and, and they're, you know, expert opinions. And, and we always say, like, if you want to get another opinion at a Mayo, at an MD Anderson, Definitely, we, we're open to that, yeah. and we want you to get opinions because we want you to make sure you know all the different options from the all the you know kind of the leading lights of the, in the country um, before you figure out what you actually want to do for yourself. Yeah, feeling confident about your treatment mm -hmm. path. Catherine wants to know what's the current prostate screening recommendation. So, so there, there's actually different guidelines. Okay. And 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 I think um, so the um, the one that a lot of people use the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Um, recommends talking about it with your doctors if, uh, for patients age 50 to 70. Uh, but if you look at the NCCN guidelines, the National Comprehensive um, Cancer Network, which, you know, I just want to put in plug, we, we just got the, uh, the NCCN comprehensive designation, which is a big, uh, nice achievement for KU. But um, the, the NCCN guidelines are actually a little bit different. Um, they actually uh, recommend um, uh, kind of um, a risk stratified type of um, a screening approach. Uh, which I think makes a lot of sense. So if you have a family history, for instance, um, like if you're African-American race, you've got a family history, um, you actually start screening a little bit earlier than that, up to age 45. Yen Liang wants to know, do people with prostate cancer need to remove the prostate a after proton therapy? Did, did you have to do that? Well, I don't have to have proton huh, therapy, did, so Was I that don't. necessary with your treatment? But so, no. I, I can certainly speak to that. Sure. Um, so um, our, our goal with radiation therapy, of course, is to cure the cancer. Um, and so uh, we never plan for surgery after radiation. Um, you know, um, a lot of places um, where you go say, what well, you cannot have surgery after, after radiation, which is not exactly true. I think some of our surgeons here are really skilled and they're able to do surgery after radiation. But the vast majority of the time, the treatment, the, the radiation treatment, whether it's proton or other radiation, uh, is going to have a cure, and um, and there's no need for surgery afterwards. Uh, Juan wants to know where can he go for more information. Um, very interesting in learning more information, kind of like our yeah. guests. Where what would be the best place to go to get the most up to date, um, accurate info? So if you're a cancer patient, we're you know all, all you know our, our doctors are welcome to have you come in and you know and, and speak in the consultation. Um, for kind of late information, I think some very reputable sources are um, the um, uh, Prostate Cancer Foundation, which is a uh, uh, very uh, good information, or, or the National um, National uh, Cancer Institute actually has a lot of uh, good information on their on their website. Uh, we also have a kind of a nice uh, patient support or advocacy group in the Kansas City um, uh, from Gildas Club and, and us too. And so there's um, some um, di multiple different resources. All right, we're making it easy today because we have a bit.ly link on the screen, Juan, that you can check out, bit.ly slash Proton C for more information about that. Uh, also wants to know, are there any side effects? Could there be any side effects to proton therapy? Yeah, you know, um, unfortunately, we, there's no magic you know, treatment that says you cure the cancer, you never get any side effects. I, I think, you know, um, Ross, any, it was awesome that you didn't get any side effects, but that's not um, the case for everybody. Um, it is a treatment. We are giving radiation to the prostate. Um, so you can have some effects on the bladder, on the urethra, which is a tube that goes from the bladder through the prostate out, you know, out the penis, um, and um, some effects on the rectum. 
Um, the difference is that some of those side effects, or the, certainly the dose to those organs, is less with the proton therapy. So um, the typical side effects, you can have some changes in peeing, urination uh, during treatment. Some people can have some um, changes in stools during treatment. Um, but it's, you know, it's very tolerable. Like, it's very rare, it's very uncommon for uh, one of our patients to, if they're working, for instance, to need to stop working, you know. You, it's inconvenient, of course, you take 15, 20 minutes out of your work day to get treatment every day, but you just keep working. And uh, so I don't think, yes, there are side effects, um, but they're pretty easy to work through. All right, few more questions. Deborah has a question um, for Warren about uh, when you found out that you could get proton therapy closer to home, you know, you don't know any different, but how great was that to know that you were staying here and could be close to family and your support system? Yeah, it was uh, a lifesaver in terms of uh, the expense outlay and the other things that you might have to uh, consider. And I just uh, was very uh, fortunate, blessed, lucky that the uh, cancer uh, center here uh, was onboarding the uh, proton therapy. So the timing in, in many ways was just perfect. I couldn't have asked for anything better. So uh, it, ma it made a big difference. Dr. Shen, can prostate cancer come back after someone gets proton therapy? Does the type of treatment you get you know, make a difference on recurrence? Yeah, uh, so it's possible. So um, uh, proton therapy is um, similar t in terms of efficacy, that it's dosed to be similar to efficacy with regular x-rays. Um, so it is possible to have recurrences. They're uncommon, um, but it's possible to have recurrences. Um, within the prostate um, uh, after treatment. That said, you know, they're pretty, pretty unusual, pretty uncommon, and we do have uh, different options we can do uh, if that were to happen. All right, Dr. Seitz, I wanna throw this last question to you from Isaac. Um, what do you make of the World Health Organization's director's recent statement, the end of the pandemic is officially in sight? <laughs> that's, yeah. no laughing. that's an optimistic view. Isn't it? <laughs> I, I, I think what they're saying isn't that COVID's going away. Right. I mm -hmm. think they're saying it's endemic and it's in the population. It's here to stay and we can treat it. And I think that that is in part quite true. Um, it's all going to come down to whether there's another variant that really becomes more infectious or more dangerous. And then I say, we're, oh, we're right back in it. But I think what they're trying to do is express optimism that because of therapy, Hawkeye, mm -hmm. and because of vaccinations that are incredibly effective, and just to say it one more time, are some of the safest therapies known to man, yeah. um, that, um, that really we have gone from having this terrible pandemic that we have to separate, and we have to wear masks, all that. And to say, okay, it's endemic, it's like a cold or flu, we can treat it, and we can stay safe with it, and we can coexist with it. And I think, I think that's really what the mm -hmm. message is, Hawk. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I would agree. I, I heard uh, Paul Offit say, I think it was Paul Offit at one point, talk about, you know, what is the pandemic, what does that mean? And, it, and his take on it was, you know, it really means how you go about your daily life. And so certainly daily life for us in the United States is quite different than, than a lot of different countries. Um, I think it's good that they made that statement. Uh, we know that the World Health Organization really needs to be focusing on um, other countries other than the United States or those resource rich uh, countries such as the United States, UK, et cetera. And so we really have to look at what is the global impact of the pandemic? How much is it affecting people's lives as far as uh, hospitalization, supply chain, mortality, all of those things. So I think it's a good statement, but I agree with you with vaccination as we can get more vaccination coverage to those other countries, that would be good. But also that comes on the heels of a large editorial that was written by a group of people um, that was sent saying all the deficiencies and the downfalls of how different governments and countries had uh, worked during the pandemic. So um, we know that there were a lot of things that could have been improved for sure. Uh, one of the major points of that group was the fact that um, there wasn't equity in vaccination coverage. For, uh, for the world. So a lot of different opinions for sure, but hopefully as we move further into this, the impact on our daily lives from this virus is going to be less and less. Certainly as Dr. Stites has talked about with uh, prevention, with vaccination and with the new treatments, that will help with the, uh, the infection standpoint, but we also know there continue to be workforce shortages, supply chain issues. So all of those things are going to take time to get back to pre-pandemic days as well. 
Can so. you just follow up on that? I think, in, in, to Warren's earlier point, it's still about healthcare disparities, and it is throughout the world, not just in the United States. And I think that is part of, I think Hawkeye, you've expressed it beautifully, is that that's one of the big challenges if we're really going to continue to make sure that the pandemic doesn't have a resurgence. We have to live with it. We have to coexist with it. We all have to keep each other safe. And to that degree, it means get vaccinated because that keeps you safe and helps keep others safe too. Let's get to our final thoughts today. Dr. Shedd, I'm gonna let you get us started. Awesome, um, just a couple of thoughts. I think uh, it's wonderful that we have proton therapy available for our patients here. Um, I, I think this, it's, it's a help, it helps people. Um, but I think, you know, there's also a whole breadth of different options that we have, and proton therapy is part of that. You know, we, um, there's very focused radiation brachytherapy, which uh, gives even more focused uh, dose to the prostate, um, even than proton therapy. Um, we have newer, newer technologies developing. And, and I think the one thought I really want to emphasize here is uh, clinical trial participation. Um, so I, I feel very strongly and passionate about um, clinical trials and uh, people enrolling on clinical trials. Um, and we actually, you know, going, going back to Warren's point, we actually need more peop black patients and other um, underrepresented minorities uh, participating in those clinical trials because all of our data are on this classic, you know, kind of um, Caucasian population and um, all of our data. And we need more information. We need people willing to jump in and support the, uh, you know, people of color jump in and support those trials and participate in clinical trials. And that's how we move uh, everybody forward in the future. Ross, uh, thank you for joining us today. I want to get your final thought. And just thanks to you and Warren, of course, for just being great examples to all of us about, you know, putting, putting our health first and asking questions and doing, and doing the work and the research. So Ross, your final thoughts today? Uh, just that uh, I feel that it, it is a very safe procedure that uh, the surgery end of it can can re cause some problems and that's and that that that's like I say that I've been free from it for over 20 years now and I'm just I've been very happy with what I had the procedure that I did yes well we're glad that you are healthy and doing well thank you for joining us Warren your final thoughts uh, thank for the um, health care practitioners, we need to become more uh, culturally competent and uh, very uh, broad in our understanding of our diverse client uh, patient base. And I think for uh, patients, we need to uh, practice self-advocacy and uh, take the time to uh, do the research to try to make the uh, best and the most informed decision you can given the different variables of your uh, circumstance. Thank you so much for, to both of you for sharing your story. And you too, Dr. Stites, for sharing your story and always hey. being so candid and oversharing. We you love know, it. I, I know. Hopefully it's not over. <laughs> no. You know, at the end of the day, um, I've given the diagnosis of cancer to way too many patients. Yeah. To be one of those people who receive that diagnosis is a life-changing moment. And um, then what you're looking for um, is hope and, and the ability to know that you're going to have the best thought and treatment available so that you can stay alive and have a good life and want and love your family and your children and get to do the great jobs you have and things like that. And I think what we have to do is support each other and try to get that hope. I think a, a comprehensive cancer center offers hope like no other. And uh, we know that patients who get care at comprehensive cancer centers live longer, do better, because you're getting hope, and, 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 and here's a hope, to Warren's point, that it's also therapy without differentiation based on race, mm -hmm. class, economic, sex. That, that's, that's true health care. And I think that um, I, I feel hope with the great people who take care of me, and I'm very deeply thankful for it. And I hope I'm a survivor for a very long time. That's what I was going to say. You're going to be around a long time. We missed you. You haven't been, you haven't been down plan. here. I know. You and I haven't been sitting here in a while. I know. This is kind of a hoot. It's kind of fun. It's All right. Kind of well, fun. come back. Thanks for being our expert and our yes, patient. We love it. I'm an um, expert patient now. And next week, you're going to be in Vegas for Open Mics with Dr. Stites. I am in Open Mics, and I think you're going to have to talk to me for I Vegas. am. So I'm going to sit in your seat. Fun. Yeah. Do I'm not gonna, adjust your TV. I'll I'm be sitting be, right here. I'm going to be gambling right Be in there. the casino. Be, yeah, we be hit the New casinos. York, casinos. Casino. Or I don't bet money because I, 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 I want to keep the dollars to spend it on the things I enjoy. Please do. And like I said, and try to yeah be on time. I will see you there, Bright, because yeah. it's going to be two hours. Yeah, it'll be real okay. early. There. Okay. I think it's 6 a.m. there. Okay. Spruce up. I will see you for Open Mics next week. Dr. Hawkinson, your final thoughts. 
Um, I mean, what is more to say than what our guests have said? Uh, just uh, those were great statements. Just to expound about what Warren said about uh, self-advocacy, I think that also goes to not only about treatment, but also continue to be your own advocate for prevention. And that is, again, uh, can't endorse this enough, being up to date with your vaccinations, but also looking for and asking your providers about those vital screening tests that need to be, need to be done at those specific times. So. All right, thank you, Dr. Hawkinson, and all of our guests today. We want to get to this story. It's an event aimed at making sure those who need health care have access to it. Next week is a Vibrant Night Gala, a fundraiser for Vibrant Health in Kansas City, Kansas. Anne Van Zee, Director of Development for Vibrant Health, joins us this morning. Anne, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. I'm well, thank you. Great. So just come out and tell us, what's a Vibrant yeah. Night all about? You know, a Vibrant Night is an amazing time. It is where a committed group of our old friends and new supporters come together to show our community that we care. Um, it is our annual fundraising event, and we're very excited that this year it's presented by the University of Kansas Health Systems. Um, and thanks to events um, and our generous supporters, we can help close that gap, um, that access gap to care here in Wyandotte County. Um, you know, every dollar raised helps provide compassionate, culturally competent, uh, and comprehensive health care to thousands of patients of all ages. Um, we provide medical, dental, behavioral health, and on-site pharmacy services um, to our patients. And this is just one way that the community can help us do that. Well, we put a bit.ly link there on your screen for those watching via or listening via podcast. That address is bit.ly backslash NMU Vibrant. That will link you to more information about this event. And I have to ask you, uh, this will be the first uh, post, you know, pandemic uh, where mm -hmm. you, you all are in person. Are there any special precautions you're needing to take? Um, not at this time. We are excited to be back in person. The last couple of years, we've been able to present a vibrant night virtually, um, and that's been a tremendous success, but we are looking forward to getting um, back together in person, celebrating safely. Um, we have some amazing live auction items, and we're going to be premiering a video. Um, three of our patients have generously shared their story of how Vibrant Health um, helps them to live better and healthier lives. And after the event, that video will be on our website so everyone can, um, can really see the difference um, that they can make if they choose to donate or participate in the gala. Again, click on that bit.ly link if you want to buy tickets and just to learn more about what you all do at Vibrant Health. Thank you so much for what you do in our community. It, it's, it's needed and, and much appreciated. Thank you, Anne. Thanks for having me. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.